Good morning, friends. We welcome you to this very special place, Sycamore Presbyterian Church. And we're gladdened by your presence here and blessed that you're among us. And we also want to take a moment and to acknowledge and greet and welcome the numbers of people who each Sunday morning join us online for the streaming of the service. We're glad you're here, too. And Please be mindful you can sign in online if you would. We would love to know that you are watching. 
Thank you for your encouraging presence as we gather on this first Sunday after Easter, celebrating the power of God over anything that is of dark and death. Nothing can thwart the commitment of God to love us, regardless of the circumstances. And that truth here is for you. Please use the friendship pads and note your presence. And we encourage you to be alert to the many things happening in our wider life and work. If you're among us and you do not have a congregational home in the greater Cincinnati area, we would love for you to consider making Sycamore your church home. We're offering a new members class on Saturday, May the 5th. It's a morning class from 8.30 to 12.30. All you need to do is to call the main office to register. We would love to fold you into that group. A couple other things. Beginning on Sunday, April the 29th at the 9.45 hour, we're going to be offering a class called Simplify Your Life. That is relevant information for loads of us. There is a book available that will accompany and be a companion to the class available at the adult ministry table if there's still some. Okay, good. Uh, and if they all get taken, we'll get some more. Just an invitation to devotionally look at maybe ways you can put your life together differently. Be alert to the fact that the week for our service to the Interfaith Hospitality Network will begin on May the 6th. Most of you already know that the good efforts of about 100 volunteers are needed in countless capacities to pull that off, and it is one way in the community Sycamore can be a welcoming place of warmth and belonging to souls who have no place to call home presently. Help us with that. There's some sign-up sheets in the connector. It's not that far off before we will be hosting Vacation Bible School, which is another way we touch the wider community. But I understand there are at least three teachers needed, one for preschool and then two for school-aged, and it takes place June 18 through 22. There's more information about it. You would be blessed by your involvement. I'm also delighted that the uh, cookbooks are on sale once again. There aren't that many left, so if you want one and have a gift in mind for someone, you want to grab it, and we want to encourage your judicious study of the cookbook and your experimentation with all kinds of recipes, and remember who your friends are when you do that, especially with the church office in mind. There's so many things happening in our wider life and work. We encourage you to note as we turn now, and Rick Rogers, our worship assistant, will call us to worship. Good morning. We are gathered together this morning, united in love. Rejoice. Be joyful as your heart accepts the Holy Spirit. Trust God and allow Him to lead you. As the Apostle Paul wrote, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, strengthen in faith as you were taught, and overflowing in thankfulness.
as we read together the prayer of confession. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry, and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed, and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak, and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant, given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in the position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are If you would like to follow along in your pew Bibles, it's on 1686. 1686. John chapter 20. And we begin reading at verse 19. Listen for God's word. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With that, and with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, and then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by that believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
And if the children will come down, please. Good morning. How are you all this morning? Are you good? Oh, good. I'm glad. Do you have some of you been on break already? Had break? Some of you back in school? And some of you still on break, right? Yes? No? Okay. I understand. I understand. I have uh, just a little bit of a story to tell you this morning. When I was five years old, I was very, 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 very sick, and I had to go to the hospital. And I was in the hospital for about a week, and for three days when I was five years old, uh, my parents didn't know whether I was going to live or die. I had something wrong with my blood, and when I was in the hospital, they, they were taking care of me, and they were doing really good things for me. And you know, I had lots of people come to see me. My Sunday school teacher came, my grandparents came, uh, different people from the church came to see me, and they loved me, and they had prayers for me, and they said good things. And and, um, I got better, and obviously I live on the other side of that hospital treatment. But in the fall, I got sick again. I had something wrong with inside me. Has anybody been to the hospital? Have you had tonsils taken out? Yeah. Anybody had tubes put in your ear? Had to go in and have that? It's kind of scary sometimes, isn't it? It just kind of, you kind of go, ooh. Well, that's kind of what happened to me when I went, when I had to go back to the hospital again in the fall and they had to take out some of the stuff in me that wasn't any good anymore. So, yeah, trust me, it's just easier. And they took it all out, and they cleaned me up, and I had to have some heavy-duty medicine, and the medicine has helped immensely. But you know what? For the longest time, I could not lift a gallon of milk. Did you know a gallon of milk is over eight pounds? I could not lift a gallon of milk, and I still go into the grocery store, and I'm still sometimes a little bit weak, and I have trouble sometimes lifting that gallon of milk, but I can lift that gallon of milk now. But my world was not really steady. I was upset. I couldn't do some things. I could not pick up my dog. I have a little bitty dog, and I could not pick up my dog. And I was upset because I couldn't pick her up. She still likes to climb on me, and if she thought she was, a, she was a parrot, she would sit on my head. So when I sit down on my couch, she comes up and she, she goes all the way up and she sits up here on my shoulder. But my world changed. I, things were just really, really, really hard for me when I was in the hospital this last time, and I was out of work for a while. But you know what this is? These are cards and prayers, and some of you have sent me these, and some of you all have sent me these, and this isn't all of them. This helped make my world steady because my world was so shaken because I didn't know if I was going to get better because I didn't know if I could lift a gallon of milk again because I didn't know if my dog, I could pick my dog up again because when I went out to walk, I was walking like this down the street because I hurt so bad. I didn't know if I'd be able to stand up again and walk straight. My world was just like this. And because people in this church and in other parts of the country and the world were praying for me, and because I got notes and letters and prayers and all kinds of wonderful things were done for me in the name of Jesus, 
I got strong and my world was not wobbly anymore. And when I ask people to pray for others, when I do the prayer time, I say, please pray for people. It makes their world steady. I really mean that because you have done that for me. You have prayed for me and you've made my world steady. You have helped me. And when your world gets like this, and maybe you have to move to a new house, or maybe you lose a good friend who moves away, or maybe you have to go to a new school and make new friends. When those things are unsettling, or things don't seem as good as they ought to be, or you're a little bit uncertain, know that Jesus is there with you. Know that people are praying for you, and know that you will come through. Nothing that ever happens to you is without God being there. Everything that happens in your life, God will be there, Christ will be there, the Holy Spirit will be there, and you will not ever, ever, ever be alone. I can promise you that. I can absolutely promise you that. And I will tell you this, you don't know this, but all these folks out here, a lot of them saw you baptized. And part of their job, and those people up here too, Part of their job, because they saw you baptized, and because you're a child of this church, part of their job, part of their ministry is to pray for you too. And they pray for your parents. So you are not alone. You, everything that happens, you will be in God's hands, and you will be in Christ, and you will have the power of the Holy Spirit with you. Okay? Let's pray. Gracious God, sometimes our world is not very steady, and sometimes we get lost and we get confused and things kind of get upside down, but you help us by giving us friends who pray for us, who hold us, who send us cards, who provide food for us, who help us through our rough times. Thank you, God, for all the goodness that you give to others. And they share with us when our life is unsteady. Thank you, God, that we know that you are always steady and Jesus is always steady. We make our prayer in your son's name. Amen. And please go have fun in Sunday school.
Friends, will you please pray with me? O risen Lord, may we behold your presence on this side of Easter and recall again that nothing, not even a tomb, can keep you from us. To the glory of your loving name, give us faith, we pray. Amen. It is his way of honoring God. His name is Jean Venier. I believe he's Canadian. And one of the ways he has sought to honor God is to provide a stable and loving environment for some of God's children. His work has been particularly with the mentally challenged And he's created a number of homes that now stretch around the world. These communities are called La Arc, named for Noah's Ark, a kind of a lifeboat place. Jean Venier is a Roman Catholic writer and humanitarian. He brings Christ's care closer to this world. I recall hearing him once say that one of the challenges in a modern world is that with a kind of instantaneous predictability, we are able to learn of situations of struggle and heartache and calamity around the globe. And many times we have no tangible way of making a response. Easily, we can feel unsettled, unsteadied by all this painful information that we take in and are unable to manage. He said a hundred years ago, if our neighbor's barn burned, we could help them rebuild their barn. We'd have a direct connect. We could do something about it, and we would probably feel good about it as well. That's often harder to do. There's an unsettled quality to life. It reminds me that everybody somehow, some way, in some fashion is dragging a bunch of baggage around. We all do. None of us is steady all the time. A former colleague of mine used to say that our great challenge in life was to love carefully. You never know what's there. You never know how fragile someone may be, how vulnerable they are, how easily they could be wounded. That kind of sensitivity of spirit must have prompted Henry James in another era to fashion these words. He said, in human life, three things are important. The first thing is to be kind. The second thing is to be kind. The third thing is to be kind. Alvin Toffler in his book, The Third Wave, said there's a harassed, knife-edged quality to daily life. He wrote that over 20 years ago. Sometimes we may feel frozen. Few things in life are always steady. How easily we can be misled. The Titanic was impenetrable. So everyone thought. 
And we remember that at our best, we will be the most steady as our lives are in the closest alignment with our living Lord. On Monday, we were closed in honor of Easter to give the staff a little breathing room. And what hit my radar was a desire to visit a nearby community that I'd thought about probably along with some of you. Moscow, Ohio, down along the river on Route 52. Many of you are mindful that on March the 2nd, when the tornadoes came through, Moscow was especially hard hit. One estimate was that 80% of that village was destroyed. About 250 people lived there. Been through there a lot of times. Because some of you know I have a love affair with Augusta, Kentucky. And as we drove in, Joyce was immediately struck by all the tarps. covering the rooftops that had been lifted off. You could see small pockets of repairs going on, and you could see large piles of bricks where a building or a home once stood. What really spoke to me, though, painfully so, was how easy it was to see that huge cooling tower that's a part of the Zimmer power facility along 52. Almost looks like a nuclear facility, but it's not. I never remember having seen it from being in the village. Of course you can see it now. There aren't any trees. What's it like? Some of you know what it's like when a tornado comes through. You remember vividly what happened not far from here, not too many years ago. How unsettled life can feel. How we know that our ultimate securities are really not found in the things of our hands, but in the things of faith. I was struck that on the side of a large wall in a building that had been damaged, there was a little plaque someone had put there. In Moscow. I couldn't read it from where I was in the car, so I decided to get out of the car and climb over some bricks and read it. Here's what it said it was a picture of a lighthouse, and it said, Faith with a guiding light, any obstacle can be overcome. Most of us have been at those times in life where we have felt that we were overwhelmed, we were inundated, we had been destabilized. Our life may have felt like an unsettled mess, and we don't know what to do about it. We may be trapped in our own human failings. It struck me the other day when I read an article by a man, I believe his name is Donald George, a travel writer for over a quarter of a century. He said of all the people he had met as he roamed planet Earth, there was a little boy in Cairo who would get his top award. Because on that day, Don had wandered into a place where he probably shouldn't have gone. He was lost. And the more he tried to save himself, the more lost he became. Back in these narrow alleyways and passageways, it was obvious that he was a stranger and people came out and began to look at him and he was scared. You know, it was back in those pre-cell phone days when you could maybe consult your GPS. Just learn how to use it. I will too. (laughs) And he didn't know what to do. You ever been like that? 
You see no visible way of getting out of your situation. You are stuck. You are scared. You are there as a byproduct of your own inattentiveness. And suddenly he felt the touch of a hand. And he looked down. There was a little boy, probably about eight, you know, piercing black eyes, black hair, looking up at him, holding his hand. And the little boy began walking with Don. He was going to lead him somewhere. It is like this little boy instinctively knew that this man was in trouble. And he began to lead him down the alleyways, around some bends, down streets, around the corner. And it was like being in the company of a little child was a shield for him against any harm happening. Because he was in the company of a little child. And as they continued to walk, finally the little boy took him out onto a main thoroughfare. And Don knew where he was. He could find his way home. The little boy had gotten him there. And they had no common language with which to say thank you, but the language of compassion, of human concern. That little boy was a hand in the dark. It was a light in the dark. And I think Jesus expects nothing less than that out of us in this unsteady walk of life. And you may be the front line to deliver it. Sometimes we are in the company of those who have put themselves in situations where they could be so easily compromised And sometimes it's just life that has happened and someone has been reduced to a sense of being vulnerable and powerless and isolated and alone and despairing and they feel so cut off. You read it all over their face. You can feel the vibe. It may be your human touch, Pat. It might be your word of comfort or encouragement. You're going to be okay. You'll make it through. I did. Just be patient. People really care. It may be your pledge to pray for them. We ought to take that seriously when we say it. It may be your listening attentiveness. In Christ's name, you're called to be a hand in the dark. Who was that hand in the dark for Thomas this morning? We know that story very well. Our friend, quote, doubting Thomas. We really identify with him lots of times. Back earlier in John's gospel, when Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Thomas fronted the question. He said, we don't have any idea where you're going. How can we know the way? We relate to this guy. But he's struggling. After the resurrection, Jesus appears in this upper room where the remaining disciples have huddled together because they're afraid. They've got a locked door behind them, but they're two missing. Judas is dead and Thomas isn't there. The only thing I can figure is he preferred to do his grieving in private. Some people are like that. They have to suffer through their sorrow alone. That's the only place they're comfortable. We can't know for sure, but Thomas wasn't there. Who reconnected him with the fellowship? Who was his hand in the dark? Who was that nudge? Was it Mrs. Thomas? Did she say, okay, enough. You have to go back and be with your friends. You need them, they need you. Was it one of the disciples who took it upon themselves to find him and bring him back? Who was it? It doesn't appear that it was Jesus in the flesh. 
Because when they finally meet in that upper room, it's like the first time they've seen each other after the resurrection. Whatever happened, it was prompted by the Holy Spirit. It was a God-honoring act to help bring someone in who was in the darkness and all alone and to help them feel the warmth of the fellowship of faith and be bolstered. I don't know who did it, but I don't believe that is anything less than what the Lord expects of us. And the Lord will bless what we make available. You know the story. The disciples are trying now to convince Thomas that Jesus is alive. Uh Uh-uh, no, uh uh-uh. He's got a list of things that have to be proven before he's going to come to faith. And beautifully so, none of this puts Jesus off. He's completely comfortable with it. Okay. You can touch, you can see, you can feel whatever you need to do, but do not be faithless, but believing. Do something. And in Jesus' sheer openness to Thomas, where Thomas is, a light goes on. And Thomas responds with the greatest confession of faith in the whole New Testament. He says, my Lord and my God. Tradition can tell us many things, but I'm always helped by this. There is a strain of tradition which believes that Thomas was the one who would travel the furthest with the gospel and credits him with the founding of the Church of South India. To go from doubt to faith, from fear to hope, From timidity to boldness, he got going. He felt compelled and propelled by the presence of Jesus to also seek to be that hand, that light in the dark. And Easter continues. There is no tomb so dark that Christ cannot penetrate it. And you know, sometimes you and I so allow our worlds to implode that we mistakenly believe that Jesus cannot get to us in our circumstances. Of course he can. A man named Clarence Hall put it this way. Easter proves this. You can put truth in a tomb But it won't stay there. This Sunday school teacher was doing her best to help her students, about a dozen, come alongside the Easter story and to sense in it a direct application for their life. So she was going to put them through a little exercise. In the class was a little boy, we'll call him Jimmy. He was physically challenged. He may have been developmentally disabled. As a group, though, they each were given one of those hard plastic Easter eggs that separate and you put them back together. And they were invited, using a variety of materials that the teacher brought, to cut something or put something in the egg and close it up that depicts to them new life. What the resurrection means, unless any of the children should be embarrassed or feel awkward, the teacher would gather them all up and then open them down in front. And so she began and she opened the first one and out popped a little picture of a flower. And she said, that's a wonderful sign of new life. She opened the second one. Out came a little section of a cookie. And she said, Jesus always gives us something wonderful to taste and enjoy. She was really good. And then she opened the third and there was nothing in it. And so somewhat hurriedly, she went to grab the fourth egg. Before she could, though, 
little Jimmy exclaimed, Don't skip me. And the teacher stopped and she said, Well, Jimmy, there was nothing in your egg. That's right, Jimmy said. The tomb was empty and that meant new life for everyone. What he believed, he lived. In his very young and fragile life, Jesus brought steadiness to his unsteady world. In the weeks that would follow, Jimmy's condition would worsen and he would die. And on the occasion of his funeral, up in front there was a small table. And on that table now appeared 12 Easter eggs. All of them opened. This Jesus has come today to touch you in a holy life transforming way with the power of God's love. It can overcome any darkness and it lifts you to your highest calling in life to belong to God, to be used by God in this world and to know the literal salvation of your soul and a well-being in life that nothing in this world can compromise. He awaits us this day to bring it to us if we will only come to him. There is still time to do that. But hurry. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. of praying together in worship this day and I would remind you that we have
people who have called in and asked for our prayers. Their names are listed in our bulletin. And we also have folks who are serving in the armed forces, and their names are listed in the bulletin. For both of these groups, please remember to pray for them and their families. Please um, intercede for them. Um, go petition the Lord. Aggravate the Lord on their behalf. That's my words. Those are, go aggravate the Lord on their behalf. Um, they need your prayers. They need your support. They need um, the strength that you can give them as you pray for them. And whether we know the person or not, we're all connected to one another in Jesus Christ. So these are our brothers and sisters in Christ that we have the privilege for praying, uh, praying for. With that, let us unite our hearts in prayer. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We praise you, we adore you, and we worship you. We are humbled by your grace and grateful for every loving kindness that you give to us. Lord God, we have many prayers on our hearts and some prayers we don't even have the breath to utter. We're not even sure if we say anything or whisper it that you will hear it. But hear the prayers of our hearts, Lord. Know that we are weighed down with hurt and agony for people who have asked us to remember them in prayer. And we understand that their lives are difficult. We understand situations are just extremely messy. And we pray for them, Lord, because they have asked us. And we know you are there in the midst of all the upheaval. We pray this day for the lost, for people who are in need of encouragement, for those who are caregivers and those they care for. There are many adults that care for children and youth, and there are so many difficult choices to make these days, Lord. Be with them as they wrestle with the choices and help them make faithful, <clears throat> wise decisions and let their decisions bring honor and glory to your name. We remember people seeking help and seeking answers, and there are just not enough resources to go around. And sometimes there are no answers that we can give that are satisfactory. There are people who have broken and fragmented lives that are just ripped apart. And we especially remember those people who have been affected by the massive um, winds and waters of nature. For people who have lived in the midst of the tornado or hurricanes, who have lived in the floodwaters, their lives are literally wiped away. We ask that you give them strength and courage and enable us to continue to serve you by ministering to them. May we be the ones who help steady their world. We remember people who doubt and who struggle with doubts and ask that you place someone near them, and it may be us, as we walk with them in this time of doubting. We thank you for every prayer that you have answered in our lives, for every person you have put in our path and brought us back into our faith journey. For every kind and gracious act that has been done in your name on our behalf, we thank you. We thank you for the people who have carried light and brought hope into times of despair and misery. We thank you for every kindness that you have called people to share and to give and to steady us when our world has been rocked and smashed. And Lord, you often call us to help steady someone else's world. Help us know that we do not go in our own strength, but we go in the name and in the power of Christ. Give us the courage and the strength 
to listen and to obey your call in our lives. Hear all these prayers of our hearts, and we know that you will bring about your will as we offer these prayers. We make this prayer in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have the privilege of making an offering of our life to the Lord. We bring our time, we bring our talents, we bring our prayers on behalf of others, we bring our financial resources, and we place our very lives into the offering plate. Let us give generously, let us give gratefully, let us give joyfully, because that's the way God has given to us. Let us worship God with our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, these gifts we bring. You have blessed us beyond our wildest imagination, and you have blessed us richly that we may bless others with these gifts. Thank you, Lord. These gifts that we bring, may they go out and they may, may they provide stability for people who have unsettledness in their lives. May these gifts be a witness to Christ and the new life and the foundation that Christ brings when we know him. Lord, thank you for blessing us and thank you for allowing us to bless others in your name. We make our prayer in your son's name. Amen. Now, friends, go with joy, live in faith, believe that life is good, and if you find it not, help make it so, to the glory of God who made us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, friendship, and power of the Holy Spirit lead us forward together each step of the way. Amen.